a free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. The measurements have indicated that Tower 1 collapsed in about 11 seconds and Tower 2 collapsed in about 9 seconds. This is essentially the rate at which free fall would happen. It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down. It could be suggested that NIST never explained the collapses by gravity alone because it would be impossible to do so without violating at least two of the most fundamental laws of physics. One is Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This means that two opposing forces will neutralize each other. In a head-on collision, the two cars absorb each other's kinetic energy and transform it into physical deformation or damage. After that, the system comes to a rest, as there is no more energy to be dissipated. The top section, pushing on the bottom section, it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. And so there's nothing left now to crush the rest of the building. Something of this kind is what we should have seen when the top section of the towers collapsed onto the lower one. The upper and lower sections should have mutually destroyed each other until all the energy is dissipated and the system comes to a rest. Alternatively, as shown in this experiment with two towers made of snow, the top section could have fallen off to the side after the initial collapse. What could not have happened is this. A little tiny chunk of the building can't possibly fall and crush the entire structure below it. This is such a simple, fundamental concept that architects and engineers were astonished in seeing it totally ignored by NIST. This is high school physics, and our whole society is being led to believe that these fundamental laws of physics, hard science, don't apply anymore. But even if we assume that the top section of the tower had enough potential energy to destroy the rest of the structure below, it could not have done so at the speed it did, which was near freefall speed. That would have violated an even more important principle in physics, known as the law of momentum conservation. This law states that the total energy within an isolated system must always remain the same. As we have seen, the energy can be transformed within the system, from motion to physical deformation, but for the deformation to begin, the velocity must decrease in order for one kind of energy to be transformed into the other. No new energy can be added to the system. One particular example of momentum conservation is freefall. Freefall happens when the only force applied on an object is gravity. This means that all the potential energy contained by the object is converted into vertical motion. As soon as the falling object hits an obstacle and breakage occurs, the speed must decrease because some of its energy needs now to be converted into physical breakage. It takes energy to break things apart, and that energy must come from within the system. Thus the falling rock cannot keep falling at free fall speed and break apart at the same time because it doesn't have enough energy to do both. Let's go now to the Twin Towers and ask a simple question. Assuming that the top section on the left contains enough potential energy to destroy the rest of the tower, and assuming we dropped both upper sections at the same time, which one would hit the ground first? It would be the second, of course. As it finds no obstacles in its path, the section on the right would quickly accelerate to free fall speed and maintain it all the way to the ground. The section on the left, instead, needs to use some of its energy to destroy the structure below, so it could never achieve free fall speed. In the case of the Twin Towers, however, both upper sections fell with an acceleration close to free fall speed, as if their path had been practically free from obstacles. It took each tower between 10 and 12 seconds to collapse to the ground, while an absolute free fall time would have been 9.2 seconds. In other words, both upper sections of the towers found enough energy to destroy 80,000 tons of healthy structure below while accelerating to near free fall speed. This is, as we have said, absolutely impossible by gravity alone. The law of momentum conservation won't allow it. 
a building cannot do free fall with a huge structural steel structural system in place to support it. Uh, the Twin Towers could, could not have come straight down through the resistance of 80,000 tons of structural steel at the speed of a practically free fall. That just would not happen. If in fact it actually hit and made an impact, it was effectively crushing anything, pushing hard on this core structure below it, the core structure is going to push back equally hard, and that's what's going to cause the top section of the building to slow down. As energy is drained away from the system to deform those members, it would slow down the descending mass and cause a descent at less than free fall speed. There is only one way for those buildings to have collapsed at the speed they did. The buildings fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed, the vertical structure. The same Shyam Sunder from NIST has acknowledged that free fall can only be achieved with the absence of a structure below. Free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. But what could have removed the supporting structure below, since the falling section didn't have any extra energy to do so? The fact that it's coming down at free fall says all of the energy is being used to just make it go straight down which means it's coming down through itself and not breaking up the building as it goes. Something else has to be clearing the way. There is only one known way to allow that kind of acceleration while removing the supporting structure. A building cannot do free fall without it being blown up. That's the only way it could come down at free fall. The only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives, in other words, controlled demolition. Since a near freefall speed automatically means a controlled demolition, the debunkers have tried to deny that the Twin Towers fell in about 10 seconds each. Tempi di crollo, si parla di 10 secondi, tempo di caduta libera, esatto, ma i tempi di crollo delle torri gemelle non sono quelli di una caduta libera. Sono, sulla base dei video disponibili, di almeno 16 secondi. Basta ascoltare la durata del boato. We couldn't count with him, as it's very difficult to establish the exact duration of a collapse by listening to the sounds only. Furthermore, a couple of seconds more or less would not make a big difference, as the time for the transfer of momentum between each collapsing floor must be considered anyway. So a floor impacting on a floor below would transfer momentum, and that floor, those floors transferring would transfer momentum so that such that in the Twin Towers, if you didn't have any columns whatsoever, it would still take a minimum of 30 seconds for these towers to collapse uh, just by transferring the momentum of the floors. In any case, the near freefall speed of about 10 seconds has been confirmed by different official sources. The 9-11 Commission wrote that the South Tower collapsed in 10 seconds. Mr. Sunder from NIST has confirmed similar timings. The measurements have indicated that Tower 1 collapsed in about 11 seconds and Tower 2 collapsed in about 9 seconds. Mr. Sunder has also acknowledged that the towers came down practically at free fall speed. As a result, the entire top of the building came down pretty much in free fall. The same admission is present in the official report. Since the stories below the level of collapse initiation provided little resistance, the building section above came down essentially in free fall. At this point, we can pose the following question. Given that the building section above came down essentially in free fall, given that for free fall to occur, no supporting structure must be present, and given that the falling sections didn't have any extra energy to destroy the structure below, can you suggest anything different from some kind of controlled demolition for the removal of the supporting structure, which was necessary for near free fall speed to be achieved? At this point, one may wonder what the response by the debunkers has been to all the scientific arguments presented by architects and engineers. There has been no response. All the debunkers have done is to either belittle this association of professionals or to ignore it altogether. And for the engineers, when you look at 
Les ingénieurs qui ont signé, alors là, c'est hallucinant. C'est-à-dire que vous avez des ingénieurs en électricité, en hydraulique, en sûreté nucléaire. Enfin bon, c'est vraiment la, la tour de Babel de l'ingénierie. Les personnes qui sont compétentes en calcul de structure, alors je les ai regardées, une petite trentaine. Petite trentaine, je, je suis généreux. Hein. Whether the experts in structural engineering are 30 or 300, it should not make any difference. It's their arguments that must be refuted, and Kirant has never done so. Atebissimo instead has chosen to belittle architects and engineers as a whole by terming all its members as gymnasium builders. Abbiamo soltanto Richard Cage e i suoi 1200 costruttori di, di, di palestre che dicono, ma secondo noi. But Atebissimo has never responded to their arguments either. But the most shocking statement comes from popular mechanics. In their book, Debunking 9-11 Myths, they wrote, not one of the leading conspiracy theorists has a background in engineering, construction, or related fields. This statement appears both in the original publication, dated 2006, and in the revised edition, published in 2011. By then, architects and engineers had been active for almost five years, listed more than 1,300 experts in civil engineering, had made presentations in 20 different countries in the world, and had been invited on national television several times. And what caught my eye is their claim that more than 1,300 architects and engineers examined the evidence about Building 7's collapse and disagree with the official report issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I certainly am much more open-minded about it than I was, and it is because of the involvement of the 9-11 families and all these engineers and architects. Clearly, uh, they know more than I do. The truth is that from the moment architects and engineers has entered the fray, not one of their scientific arguments disproving the official version and confirming the theory of controlled demolitions has been refuted in any way by the debunkers or by anyone else.